So we are live and waiting for people to join. Well, already, already 25 people. Welcome, everyone. It is great to see you here. I hope you can hear me. Let me know in the comments if you have any problems with the voice and everything. Yes, welcome. So we are going to wait a couple more minutes for everybody to join. Hi, hi, Pascal. Hi, Jayesh. Hello, everyone. Hi, Ruth Raksh. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Hello from Munich as well, Hamza. Um, so welcome, everyone. It is great to have you here today for our session. I'm super, we are super, super excited to have you. Um, so this will probably be one of like the first, um, first webinar of a series. So super excited to kick this off. So I think while we are waiting for others to join, we would like to know more about you. So it would be great if you can scan the QR code and tell us what are you doing in your organizations, companies, what is your role, um, so that we know the audience a little bit more. And when it comes to concepts that we are going to explain, we can be more empathic. Okay, ML engineer. Makes sense. Makes sense. And also let us know in the comments where are you coming from? What are you doing? Hello from Bangalore. Hi, Jaish. Madrid, India, Hungary. Great. We have a diverse audience. Technical founder. Technical founder. Okay. Data scientist. Okay. Great. Great, great, great. So, people. AI consultant. AI consultant. So, are you like directly creating products, technical products, or just giving consultancy? It's interesting. Two participants are typing. Okay, already 42 people, but I would like to hear a little bit more from you. Hi from mom. Hi. Hi, Sabine. I guess. Canada. Great. Okay, very engaging audience. I already love it. So I would say we will start in a minute or two for ML engineer, three data scientists, ML elite. Great people. So, so, so we have a very focused group today. I think you are definitely in the right place. Hi, Mustafa. Hi from Munich, ML engineer support, Fabio. Perfect. Um, yes, NLP engineer, it's, it's great. Okay, we have a focused group, this is good, but also probably you are working different parts of the uh, whole ML ops um, platforms and pipeline CPO. Hello, welcome. So we also have founders probably in the in the webinar right now, I assume. Hi from Czech Republic. Hi Valentin. It's great to have you here today. So uh, it's already almost five minutes and we are reaching to 50 people. So I will like slowly, we will slowly get started to our webinar. At this uh, point, I will introduce Hamza, our CTO and co-founder of ZenML, to the stage, and Alexei, uh, one of our ML engineers, and they will kickstart our webinar and explain the whole concept to you. Super excited for this. And now I'm welcoming them here. Hi, Hamza. Hi, Alexei. Hey, hi, hi. Hi there. Hello. Nice. It seems like it's an amazing crowd. I, I really enjoy when people all over the world get together for a singular purpose here. So today we're going to be talking about some interesting topic, uh, like maybe a good, good time to switch to the slide. Yeah, we're going to be talking about automating the MLOps workflow end-to-end -end for computer vision. Um, 
Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hamza. I am the co-founder of Zenimal. I have been doing machine learning engineering for the last eight years and have worked on a lot of computer vision use cases um, in production. And uh, it's it's been a quite a journey starting from where we came from in computer vision to what we have today. And at Zenimal, um, our company is a tooling company and we have seen many different people in our community doing different things. So today we thought we would gather some of the best practices and present the workflow that we think is ideal um, for practitioners of computer vision. Um, I'll pass it to my colleague Alexei who will be helping me today with the webinar. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Hamza. Thanks, Yamor. Um, I'm Alexei. I'm an ML engineer here at ZenML. In a past life, I also did a lot of computer vision um, projects which was one of the driving factors to drive me into MLOps to address some of the issues that a lot of computer vision projects face. And I'm very excited to show you our interpretation of how uh, computer vision MLOps should be done. Exactly. So I know that we've had such, um, such a cool introduction to ML engineers. I'm, I'm sure we'll have many questions. Um, a brief introduction to the agenda of today. We're going to be uh, doing slides in a bit. It's not going to be very long, don't worry. We're, I'm just going to be setting up the groundwork for the real meat of today, which is going to be uh, a deep dive demo into the MLOps loop uh, in computer vision. And uh, Alexa will help me with that. We're, we are going to have a Q&A at the end, so please stick around. If you have questions in the meanwhile, please put them in the chat on your right side. Um, we, I will be keeping an eye out with Jamur and we can take questions as we go. Um, I'm sure there will be many, so don't be shy. All right, so for people who don't know us, um, ZenML is um, a startup that is developing the ZenML framework. Uh, so we are a company behind the product. We're now 15 people spread out all over the world, uh, in, in Germany mostly, but also I think half of us are really spread out in all the continents. Um, we've had three years since we've released the first version. It's been more than 100 releases, 6,500 commits on the main repo. Um, we, have, we, have, we have many other repos as well, so I'm sure that number is <laughs> uh, at least double that. Um, last month, 20,000 people ran pipelines who have telemetry turned on. This was really interesting for us to see how usage has grown over time. Um, and open source and managed offerings are both available with ZenML, so we have a product which is quite mature now after 100 releases. And we, in, a, in last October, we released a, a, a managed version of that with extra features for companies that are ramping up their MLOps game. And um, if you were to choose any of these options, you'll see you'll be in good company. Uh, you might recognize some of the logos down there. Hundreds of companies already use us in production. I'm very proud to work with them uh, because it's amazing to see a small you know, open source project grow to such um, mature MLOps platforms um, like yeah, the ones that you see below. We have a thriving Slack community, by the way. So if you go to zenml.io slash Slack, you'll be redirected to the Slack channel. We, that's our primary mode of communication to our community. We talk to each other a lot here, there. And if you want to learn MLOps and meet practitioners, I think it's a great place to be. But what exactly are we doing? So I, I know a lot of you probably know ZenML already for those who joined, but uh, a quick introduction of the problem we're solving. For those of you who are ML engineers, you probably deal with standardization of machine learning practices inside your companies. If you're learning as a student right now, you're also probably studying how many different complexity is arising from the MLOps landscape, uh, especially in the world of in the world of Gen AI. You have different tools, different infrastructure, different people. And what ZenML does is we help take some of that complexity away or in an experience layer and allow you to build your own MLOps platform um, using our framework um, that brings together all your tooling and infrastructure needs in a way that is great for developers, is open source, you can learn the best practices and you can also put together all of those integrations that we've already built uh, and extend it if, if, if you'd like. The goal is really to make MLOps simple and accessible for everybody. Um, we saw data scientists, ML engineers, founders here in, in the call today, but uh, we really want ZML to be the source of truth for all your ML operations. Um, how it works briefly, so you have 
uh, we have our Python library. A Python library, you decorate the your functions with with our decorator, just like most pipelining tools. And then on the other side, you define how those pipelines run in stacks, which is the configuration of your infrastructure. Um, this is something that we will talk about today. And the framework handles all the rest. So you know, building Docker images, pushing it, setting up the infrastructure, scaling up, setting up your experiment tracking. So many things that you can do. Um, you know, like XenML takes a lot of the heavy lifting away for you and tracks everything in a central um, layer. Computer vision, why computer vision? So it's really exciting for computer vision. I think most of you who are joining today are practitioners. I think it's one of the most exciting years for CV. We have great new models, YOLO V8, which we're going to be showing today, but also Segment Anything, Dino, uh, Stable Diffusion 3, um, Text to Video has been great. Sora you, demos have blown people's mind. Multimodal LLMs with Lava. Um, these vision transformer models can also reason now. So it's really exciting today to be a computer vision practitioner. And I'm very excited to see the industrial use cases that will inevitably pop up as we try to productionalize these. And how do you do productionalization is what we're going to talk about today. So it's one thing doing this manually, stitching things together, but another to put this into an industrial way, automated, centrally tracked. Um, usually this circle starts with your annotation tool, Label Studio, for example, you could use anything that you wanted. Um, then you go all the way to training your label data, um, running batch inference on it or deploying it in real time, exporting those predictions from new data and putting it back into tools like 51, Albumentations um, to augment the data that you want to reuse again to finish that loop. Uh, this is the so-called data flywheel for computer vision. Uh, popularized by Andrew Carpathy, of course, from Tesla. And uh, we've seen this in action many times, and it's always interesting, always has its challenges. And we're going to be showing you one particular iteration of that, which we think works very well. And uh, yeah, that's the setup. So without further ado, I think, Alexei, it's time to get into the code. All right. Thank you, Hamza. Um, all right, everyone. So. As Hamza said, we will start this whole process within our within our labeling tool. Uh, we spared you the grueling labeling work, so all of this is done already. So we can start at the point of us having a finished data set. And this data set, so to describe a little bit my setup, I have Label Studio deployed locally. The data is living in a, a GCP bucket, but I now want to export my labels so that my um, remote uh, compute can access it and do training on it. So to do that, we're going to head over to code. I'm going to trigger a script. And while we do that, I can explain a little bit to you what the script will be doing. Hamza, can you switch my? Yes. So. This is um, what, what we're looking at right now. So as I described, we have our data set over in GCP in a bucket. Uh, Label Studio sits on top of this, and we have our labels locally. We have our export pipeline, which takes the data from Label Studio and uploads it into another cloud bucket that we will be using later on. As you can see above our pipeline, um, this is a stack. So I am running this locally on my machine. The things that are inside, like this stack describes my local setup with my connection to Label Studio. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about this later when we get to the training step. And what I also want to highlight at this point is our model control plane. So here at ZNML, we don't think a model is just the binary that comes out of a um, training. A model is much more and needs to be much more. So in this case, before we even start training our model, we already created this, um, this XenML model, which contains the reference to the data set and the labels. And we will be using this at a later stage in our process. So what this pipeline should be doing, if we switch back to my screen, this pipeline ran. As I described to you, it used my local, local stack. Um, you can see this has some, some components in it telling you where the where the data lives. Uh, this is a Google Cloud um, bucket. 
and what Label Studio instance I'm using, for example. But this could, for, for your use cases, be another labeling tool, or it could be deployed instead of local. Um, this pipeline has finished running. Let me, it opened up in my wrong screen. Let me drag it over here. So this is the, the DAG that we have for it. This pipeline only has one step, so there's not too much to see here. Um, we have the step here. And within the step, we can inspect the code. So you can see this is fairly simple um, Python code that you just have to annotate with a step decorator. And you can look at things like metadata in case there is metadata. Um, in this case, we didn't have any metadata for the step, but we have our data set. So this is a reference to the, as you can see here, to the bucket where our data lives. And if you, so if you're developing, I mean, all of developments is an iterative process. You can now just use this code to access the, um, the data that was produced by the step and see what it looks like, get a feeling for it and interact with it. I think there's think. a uh, hmm? there's an interesting question in the chat um, talking about how to automate image labeling, um, like how do we actually automate the entire thing? And I, I think we are going to be talking at the end of how you can semi-automate it. I, I think full automation is something that we've been dreaming about, and I'm sure it comes in the horizon. But you can at least semi-automate it, Swarup, and we'll show you when you close the loop how you can use your model to automate some of the labeling. Yes, I mean, there's always going to be some some pain in the beginning, but by creating this data fly, we'll be try to make it as easy as possible on yourself. And we'll we'll call back to that question at the very end of this. Um, so that finishes our export. So what we did is we took data, in my case, that was local, the labels, not the images. The images were already in a cloud bucket. The labels were local, and we transferred them in a, into a GCP bucket in a way that we can now interact with it. And as I mentioned the models earlier, I want to highlight this quickly. So we have a bunch of models here, but for this webinar, we're talking about ship detection. Maybe that's something I can quickly introduce as well. We're doing object detection. Um, that's what we were looking at in Label Studio earlier. Uh, in particular, we we use the ship uh, detection data set from aerial footage. Um, so we have one class. We want to find ships on images, um, just to keep it very simple here. And the pipeline I just ran is this one. So, or the pipeline I ran produced this model. So this is the model version that was produced by the pipeline that we just ran. As you can see, this is there's no model yet because it was just an export pipeline. But this is a place where we can now ex inspect already all the data that we're preparing for the model training. So that's that's what we see here. And what we want to do now is um, maybe that's also something that we should discuss early is for this whole data flywheel to work, we want to decouple these different pipelines from one another. We don't want to run pipe, one pipeline and then manually go trigger the next one, manually go trigger the next one. Instead, the manual processes will happen whenever they happen, maybe whenever data is available, whenever data has been labeled. Like this is a manual process. Someone's going to trigger somewhere, either in their local machine or in their CI. Um, but now we want to decouple the training pipeline. We want to maybe run this one on a schedule. Every week it should run again and produce a, a new model. Um, and so for that, we we use stages for our model. So in this case, I'm going to say we're going to promote this model to staging, saying this one is ready to be picked up by the next training. So that moved our model to staging now. And now we can go into the training step. Let's uh, have a look at that in in our slides first. So this is what we just did, just the promotion of the model. Um, just to highlight here, we we are saying this will, will be running on a schedule for the purpose of this webinar. We're not going to wait for, for the scheduled time. We're going to trigger this manually. But what happens is we, we now have our annotated data over in our GCP bucket. We have another GCP bucket with the images. And we have the model control plane that tells us for this specific data set, where to go look. So that's where we have our training pipeline. It communicates with the model control plane, finds out where does the data live right now, and then can pull it from there. So, I saw you unmuted, Hamza, so go ahead. Yeah, I was just interested. So is, does that mean that where the handover process is 
a bit more decoupled in the sense that the model control plane has the reference to the data. So the training pipeline probably doesn't need to think about and how to fetch the data, whatever. It just references the staging model. Is that how you think about yes. it? Yes. Yes, exactly. So so we, we have a loose coupling here where we say we have something called a staging model, and this is going to contain the data set and just always use the one that is currently in, in the staging stage. Um, so this, again, as you said, decouples our uh, data generation and data labeling from our training. And if for some time there's no new labels that come in, then it's going to keep training on the same data um, without any interference. Um, in this case, what I also want to quickly highlight is the GCV webinar GCP stack on top. Um, so this is going to not run on my local machine. This is going to run remotely. It could run on my local machine. We're going to get to that as well. But um, this will run remotely. And let me quickly show you how we do that over in my code editor. So we have a collection of stacks that we prepared. This, this, this is a one-time setup. Someone in the team has to set this up. It's fairly simple. Um, part of the stack is going to be a, a container registry because we now need to containerize our pipeline. Um, part of this is going to be a vertex orchestrator. Um, let me start running it because this will take some time, as you might imagine. It's a good time for a question. I think we, Eric and uh, Dragos, was talking about having multiple models at staging to be picked up by respective training pipelines. I think the like I, I think I can answer that. So. The way we think about models is one model can be one customer. So let's say you have, in this case, we have only one customer, the ship data set, but let's say you have um, in a use case of, I don't know, plastic detection, you have every city, it gives you your, your data. So you have Lahore, Munich, you know, London, everyone is a different data. So you can have a list of all of your models modeled as one per customer. So you could have like uh, Lahore or like London or Paris as, as one model and everyone has their own versions of data. So you can really use this ontology, this uh, um, um, let's call it this, like the way we think about these things to like bucket your customers into, into these uh, names and associate different stages for their particular versions and namespace them together. Or another example would be projects. So if you have different projects at your company that produce different models, this will be different namespaces here. Exactly. But yeah. I mean, if if with models, what you meant was multiple like model artifacts, maybe you have models that build on top of each other. Um, this is something that we can represent as well here. So one Xenimal model can have multiple of these things in it. Awesome. OK, so I started a run. Um, I did not start a run. I, I just lied to you. Let me quickly mm. see what. Uh, it's because it's training, training. not train. <laughs> yes, common mistake. But luckily, before this webinar, I already prepared a run. <laughs> so I could show it to you because these things take a while. So as you can see, maybe I just quickly want to show you this actually did run on, on Vertex. So we, we can inspect this pipeline over on Vertex. Uh, closer to the hardware, um, but we can also inspect it over here in our own dashboard. And this is the pipeline that now it loaded the model. This is something really cool about ZenML. Um, steps can be cached. So if a step does the same thing every time, it loads data from somewhere or does like complicated calculations, but nothing changed, then it's cached. And then you don't as you can see, this took zero minutes and zero seconds. So you can save a lot of time if you, you're, you're trying to iteratively get somewhere. Um, this produced a raw YOLO model. So in this case, we uh, loaded this from Ultralytics, but it can be from, from anywhere else. It can be also from a previous pipeline run. So you can keep training on, on top of your best weights. Um, you can write the code however you want here. And then we have this data set. So this is loaded from our model control plane. I was showing this to you earlier. This was produced by the step that I ran earlier. And then we have our train model. And here, I, I just want to show you, this is the code, the kind of code that you're used to. This is a, a PyTorch model being trained. And we have some, some, some different things being set up. Because we're running on the cloud, we have four GPUs behind this. Uh, but if we're running this locally, we can decide to not use any GPUs. Um, 
And the same code will work if you're running it locally or remote. So that, that is one of the things that, that stacks offer you. Um, what we can look at here as well is the, the configuration that went into this pipeline. So you can see the batch size that we set, the image size and the epochs. So you have all of this neatly um, tracked for you. Um, Alexei, how would you schedule um, schedule such a pipeline? Because right now you ran it and it ran one time, but how would you schedule it? Okay, so that, that brings me to introducing how we parameterize our pipelines. So pipelines are not, or pipelines shouldn't just be code. Like there's a clear separation between code and configuration. And, and this is something that we try to enable and encourage. So, so the things that you want to change between runs frequently, maybe that you want to change between machines, which between um, your team, like who, who's running it between the people. Um, so everyone can have their own um, settings the way they want to. Um, I'll, I'll quickly run through it and then we'll get to the schedules. So you can have parameters you set at pipeline level. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you have dockerization. So we need to dockerize our pipeline and this is how you specify the different requirements you need to install in your Docker image and the different app packages that you might need. And when you have very specific needs, so let's say um, we want to run the train, uh, the, the our, our train step that, run, that trains the actual model. Um, this one we want to run on a CUDA image, obviously. And here we're selecting different accelerator types. But as you, as you mentioned, Hamza, um, if we want to set this up as a schedule, one of the ways you could do it is inside of this configuration file. So you could just like here, we're um, configuring our step operator vertex. We could also configure our orchestrator, which is also a vertex orchestrator, and give it a schedule with a um, cron cron expression that tells it how often to run and all of these things. So all, all of the configurability that Zanimal offers, or a lot of it is exposed here for you to use um, however it works best for you. And and how is this YAML referenced in the code? Like, uh... Okay, so the way that we reference this in the code, so um, I haven't shown you much of the, the code that I'm running actually, because this is mostly um, configured for the webinar. This is not how you would probably do it in your, your live projects, but we have this training pipeline. Um, as maybe I'll click through it. This is a pipeline. We annotate it like this. The pipeline has certain parameters and stuff. Um, it has steps that it references and um, calls. And when you want to run this pipeline, you can just simply specify the location of the YAML file, and then it runs it with that YAML file populating all the parameters. Cool. Um, so this pipeline was uh, successful earlier. So let's head on over to our model control plane and promote that one because our current pipeline that we send for training won't be done for some time yet. So I think it's this pipeline, uh, this one. No, it's not this one. I think it was the staging one, the one above 28. The staging one is the most recent one. This shouldn't have a, oh, you're right. Okay. So this one already has a trained YOLO um, model in it. As you as you can see, you 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 get um, this, this whole list of different, like you, you could also set checkpoints in here if you want. Um, but in this case, we have our initial YOLO data set and our trained one. We have all the data sets. So now we also have the validation metrics that you might be interested in. Um, they are also for the model directly. You, you will have it in here as metadata as well. So you can see these metrics aren't great. Um, we just haven't let it train for long enough. We haven't given it enough data, um, but this is just for, for sh showing how a pipeline like this could work. And um, once you start improving data and epochs, this should improve as well. And the other thing that we can now quickly show here as well is now you can also see how this whole thing ties together. So we have this Zenema model, the ship detector model, and you can see what pipeline was used to export the data. You can see what pipeline was used to train the model. And you can see what stacks were used for these two different pipelines. And when you go into it, then again, you have all this metadata, all this traceability. If you ever need to go back to a model that you trained in the past to understand how you got there, Zenema has the solution for you here. 
Okay, let's assume this is the best model we've ever seen. Like this, this blows us away. We want to, we want to bring this into production. Um, all we have to do is transition our model to production. And now um, we can have, depending on what your setup is, where you deploy your models, you can now use it, load it from here and um, bring it to the places where it needs to be. In our case, um, we're gonna be talking about batch inference um, to highlight how this will now be used in production. Um, maybe let's have a look at the slide first. Maybe this is also a good place to ask if there's any questions that have come up so far. I'm trying my best to answer them on the chat, but for the sake of the recording. So uh, there was a few, there was one question about how do you configure the cloud instances? So I think Alexei, you showed in the YAML config file that you could specify whatever cloud instance you wanted, and this can run on AWS, on TCP, on whatever you can specify that in a different config YAML for each cloud. Um, can you abort a running pipeline if it looks like it's not converging and you want to not waste the GPU utilization? Great yeah. question. I think you can, right? Like you can just cancel it. If it's on a scheduled run, you'll have to um, find out the main process. I think that also depends on the orchestrator, right? So you depends yeah, yeah. on the orchestration mechanism. And uh, I mean, there's so many ways that you can do it, but right now this is running synchronously with my command line. So I can do a simple control C and it will send that command over to Vertex in our case. Yeah. Is there a button in the UI for this? No, Eric, but great feature request. I'll, I'll put it in the back burner for the team. Okay. Let's get back to the step five, which is running inference. Yes. So let me just uh, paint the picture of where we are now. So let's say we have this model that we want to run in production. And for us, production means running inference batches on customer data that piles up over the day. So in this case, we have customer data or production data, new data that wasn't in a training set that is loaded into a GCP bucket somewhere. So in our case, we, we have this bucket and we, we know where it is and we want to run this pipeline. And what it's gonna do is this inference pipeline will now use the production tag to find the model that is currently in production. It can load the model out of it it now runs inference using this model and stores the predictions back into the model control plane. So now you have one single place where you can quickly see all the data that was ever like predicted on by your model and its predictions. So this, this sets you up already for, for using this data either to understand better what your model is bad at. You can do a hard example mining to maybe improve your model architecture or your pre-processing. Or you can just use the data to um, label those hard images and put them in the in the training set. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, let's quickly run this. And I'm going to choose to run this locally so we don't have to wait for anything to be provisioned. So I'm switching back to my local stack now. Mm -hmm. So you could you could have run this also remotely, but you chose to run it locally. Like why did you do that? Yes. Yeah, so um, I don't. Docker builds are cached, so that's that's usually not an issue. That the Docker building takes time. I mean, once you've done it once, the Docker build is cached. It's it's going to work. Um, but Vertex sometimes, especially around this time, <laughs> has some takes some time to pick up your jobs. So I, I don't want to keep you guys waiting. Mm. It's a good and I want to show you how you easy can... it is to to, sh to switch. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you there, Hamza. No, I was going to say the same thing. So it's the same code base that you could run on cloud, and you just with one flag you can just run it locally as well, which is faster. Um, it's pretty cool. Exactly, and there's like I'm not picking up this flag to change anything in the code. So this this is all handled with ZenML. So as you can see, it's producing another run for us. And again, this is a pipeline with one step. We try to keep it very simple for the webinar to show show the different uh, features that that you need along the way. So now, while this is running, we can already have a look at our code. Again, this is code that most of you are probably familiar with. Mostly, um, we're loading a data set 
from a file location, applying our model. Um, and this is some Zenima specific things where we now logging this artifact metadata so that we can look at it in our UI or keep track of it. There's a there's an interesting question about uh, data caching and data copying over, and I think this is where you could. I think one of the things that we wanted to focus on was the file I/O um, part of this code. So I, the question is, how how is data copied from the bucket into a into a location where the GPU is, for example, um, if I got it right? Okay. Yes, that's that's very similar to what we're looking at right here. So file I/O is one of the um, functionalities that ZenML brings with it. This is our file IO. Um, it works on any of the big cloud providers and on local file systems. So it's it's agnostic of what the file system is. So you, so you can give it a, a, a path to a GCP bucket, or you can give it a path to a local file and S, S3 bucket and whatever, as long as the permissions are set up properly, you can copy this these files locally by just writing code that you might be familiar with with OS copy. Um, and in, in this case, what we're doing, just so, so I can explain what we're doing here, is we have the data set in, in a GCP bucket. But to do inference locally, obviously, we're going to have to copy it into our local file system. And then we, we do that so that we can create the data set out of it. And under the hood, ZenML uses all of this as well for our for all the outputs of steps and inputs into steps. So if the output of a step, I mean, if, if it should be run by another pipeline, we have to persist it somewhere. So we persist it in an artifact store using our file IO and the artifact store again, could be your, GC, uh, your S3 bucket. It doesn't, like, doesn't have to be your file system. And then yeah. another pipeline can pick it up from there and we know exactly how to load it again. Yeah, there's a, uh, I think the question goes farther about uh, multiple reads for multiple training jobs. I think. Uh, there's there's a feature in development right now in ZenML that makes this easier to mount a volume into the training jobs um, for for every orchestrator. So this will be even faster in the future. But right now we're re we're really doing a file I/O copy, so this might be slower. Or you could use another. Um, I, I suppose nothing stops you from using a high performance uh, library to read the data as well. We've chosen to use this because our data is um, something that I mean, our, like the performance for this pipeline we've noticed is quite quite decent. Yes. Excellent. So then I would head back into my terminal to show you that it finished running. Uh, the dashboard just hasn't heard about it yet. Probably just uh, uh, a refresh away. So this means our pipeline or our pipeline predicted the data and created an inference data set. And now this is something we won't be doing inside of a Zenima pipeline because we have to create a session and that we're going to be waiting in. So now we'll be using 51. Um, 51 helps uh, is a tool that helps you analyze predictions that were made by your model, um, helps you curate them, helps you pick out things that might look odd to you, and then also helps you bring this into your labeling tool. So that's what we'll be doing now. Um, we'll be looking at the images that our model tried to predict on. So this is on, again, just to just to go back to it. So this is, let's say we waited a week and new data came in, and now you use the production model to label it. So now we're going to be seeing the predictions, right? Uh, yes, exactly. And again, this could be completely decoupled. Like your production model could have been running every day. It could have been producing a whole pile of data for you. And maybe you you have a calendar item every Friday. You go and check in how the model is doing, how the data looks that it predicts on. So you have this, this whole observability control plane now. And we, as, as you can imagine, with the, the few epochs and the few images that we have, the images are not very well labeled. Here it's predicting some industrial buildings. Um, let's, let's maybe just here it's predicting some some roof. So let's for the for the sake of this webinar, let's let's just take these two images and um, perform some argumentations just so we can extend our data set. Let's say you found. Uh, a few images that you feel like represent 
the problems that your model is facing very well and you want to train your model to not um, to, to not make these same mistakes again. So through augmentations, we're going to be creating some, some data to, um, sorry, slipping my mind right now, to, mm -hmm. to um, augment it. And augment it, that. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Hamza. So just one second. Um, having some sort of lag right now. OK, so yeah, it's lagging. Ah. <laughs> maybe, maybe I, I tried so clicking funny. on the screen shared image of my <laughs> screen, and I was wondering why nothing is happening. I, I'm seeing my screen twice. I was using the wrong one. OK, so um, here what we'll be using is color jitter, ISO noise, maybe. Yeah. OK, maybe color jitter is, is a good one. And we'll be doing it on the selected samples. There's also, yeah. OK, so we'll be executing that. And this is now going to create more copies of our data with these augmentations applied to them. Yeah. Seems 51 like, crashed. yes, 51 crashed. Let me just start it again. Maybe it's. Have stored the new data, anyways. It's uh, like I know this uh, bugged out, but generally, fifty-one. We have to shout out them, right? Because they're such a great tool. They've been really amazing uh, for the computer vision community. Their their mind feature, where you can augment these things and make this easy to curate data, has been quite a game changer for many computer vision practitioners. And they make it also really easy to 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 train data directly on these data sets that you have there. So they make it super easy to quickly iterate. Um, really have been enjoying using them. But somehow something in the background for me crashed. I'm not sure how I can recover here. Maybe you can. I mean, like live de debugging in a webinar is <laughs> understandably. <laughs> Uh, it's stressful. Yes. I'm not sure if the, if the host port is bugging out. I can it's... I can maybe take questions in the meanwhile. All right. Let's uh, let's see how quick your debugging is. <laughs> right. So I think we have a couple of them in the Q and A. Um, one thing I've really found hard with CV is converting annotations back and forth between the annotation formats. Do you have any tips on that painful point? I agree with you completely. I think that's something when we were setting out the um, this this example, we were really trying to um, um, like like uh, figure out the different formats. And like one of the things I find really interesting is there there are so many standards for annotations. Please shout me out in the chat if I'm wrong. And there's not really one standard. So Label Studio. I mean, there is this Coco format, there's this YOLO format, like sort of these standards are there, but then there are certain nuances for custom classes and all those things. And it's, uh, there are converter libraries that are not super well maintained with these tools, which are sometimes a bit painful. And I feel like oftentimes you have to stick to the really standard. And if you have to do something around the edges, you have to dig into the code base and try to figure it out. So I, I also find converting annotations quite painful. What we've done here today is there is this label studio conversion format library that we've been using, which has proven to be very, very helpful. And we've written some custom code around the edges for 51 and label studio. Um, so please sh let me know if I'm missing anything, by the way. I might be rusty on some libraries. Maybe there's a brilliant library out there that helps with annotations. If there isn't, maybe it's good for open source community to do it. Um, how does NML handle big data, especially large images? Is that a problem? Great question. So um, ZML has this file IO abstraction that is very efficient in copying over large data sets. Of course, if it gets really big, then you'd probably have to switch to specialized tooling. We have a Spark integration. Uh, array integration is probably on the roadmap. Um, you can also use really fast, efficient reading. Like if you convert it into by arrow and read it directly, you could do that in a ZML step. Sometimes I've seen people do that, um, which has been really um, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's basically the same. Like they mount a bucket into their pipeline, bring the data closer, 
uh, use PyArrow or something to read it directly into PyTorch. Um, you can also distribute, of course, um, if you want to do distributed data training or, or distribute the model across GPUs, uh, we've seen both. But ZenML sort of doesn't take an opinion on that because it's such a complicated space. Like it feels like it's a space in its own. And if we try to do so many things, I think it'll uh, we'll start quickly start to not be the best at it. Uh, there's many different ways of handling these, and um, yeah, I think that should I think you're you will be well served using the native libraries. For example, the PyTorch data loader, Eric. Um, like what you can do is you can like persist the data loader of PyTorch directly as an artifact in ZML and load it in. Um, so like you can see here in the model control plane, you can put artifacts and some of these artifacts, like I think this picture is might be misleading. We're not actually persisting data inside ZML. So ZML is a metadata server. Um, it doesn't store any data. It just stores references to data and helps you materialize data from those references if you want it. Um, so in, in the case of a PyTorch data loader, what you could do is you could um, simply persist that object artifact or a reference to that artifact, like the path to the images, uh, as an artifact in ZML and establish a lineage that way. So we don't, we don't really uh, take, let's say, take an opinion on actually materializing huge data sets because sometimes that happens at the orchestration layer or it happens at the PyTorch layer, which is very well managed anyway. Uh, using, you know, you can use PyTorch Lightning, you can use different libraries that specialize in that. Uh, we just help you move you closer to the data and get that pipeline running. Another question is PII data. I, I like that one. A question about working with personal identification uh, data. Personal identification? Yeah, this personal data. Can ZML be applied to this type of application so that there would be no PI data leak? Would you be so kind to point me to the documentation? What information is being collected, sent, accessed by ZML client? Um, so ZML, as I said before, was uh, is a metadata server. So we don't store data at all. Uh, if you use both open source and cloud versions, it's, it's really just a metadata truth layer for you. Uh, and it's on the other side, it's a framework to author pipelines. Um, so if you have personally identifiable information, um, what you can do is you can make sure in your application layer, um, not um, put put things, you know, I mean, but that's probably if you're doing compliance, you're probably very careful about that. Um, I can share the cloud architecture if somebody's interested. I, I, I like, Yamar, could you put my screen up? Maybe I can talk about this architecture if that's interesting for you people. Share this tab. Yeah, I mean, this is the ZenML Cloud. It applies to ZenML open source as well. So um, basically what we're doing here is we're storing just the, the API server just stores machine learning metadata. And the metadata is things like, has my pipeline been run? What is the status of my pipeline? What is the name of my model? Uh, those things, of course, might be sensitive, but all of the secrets and all those things can be stored on your secret store that you can hook up to ZML when you deploy it. I can't make it bigger, actually. I, I'll try. Uh, it seems to be the upper limit. It seems to be, yeah. I will probably have it locally. Open image and new tab. Ah, that, that's better. Okay. So uh, this is also the wrong diagram. Excuse me, I have to open the right one. So we have different deployment scenarios, but this is the most representative. So you have ZenML Cloud API, ML Metadata, which is, again, as I said, does not contain PII. If you don't want it to, you should be careful, of course. And then you have the secret store. So that stores all your service accounts, all your credentials, all those things. You can bring your own secret store as you deploy ZenML. So we can connect uh, through a secure connection. And then all the pipelines, run on either locally on your machine, which is usually going to be in your environment, or it's going they're going to run on the orchestration service like AWS, um, SageMaker pipelines, Vertex pipelines. Um, and any other stack component like Label Studio also stays like that. So that's a very common question that we get about ZenML. Um, because it presents itself like an orchestration tool, I think people often get confused by, by what data exactly flows through it. And of course, we're open source, by the way, so you can look at the SDK docs 
uh, if you go to the SDK docs.xml.io, you'll be able to see all, all the different functions and functionality we provide to query the API server. Okay, then. So just just an update. For some reason, my machine is is having issues. I'm I'm not able to to rerun my code here. Um, I can I can talk you through what should have happened if this hadn't crashed. Um, because we're, we were just two steps away from from the end of it. So um, what 51 allows you to do is um, it allows you to export your labels that your models created. Um, maybe if we go back to, to the circle that we had. Um, so it allows you, once you, we've done the argumentations, it allows you to export all of your data to Label Studio. So let's say you mined 50 hard examples and you extended it with argumentations to 150 images. Now you can export all of these to Label Studio. And then we would have ended up again at the exact same place that we started the demo with. Um, within Label Studio, we would have now corrected the labels to make sure that we, we um, find out all the mistakes that the models made, um, capture all the ships in our case. And then we could have kicked off our process again. And the beauty here is once you have this data flywheel set up, there is no friction between these things. Like, like once the data is then labeled, so maybe that is outsourced. Once you get the go ahead, okay, all the data has been labeled. You can start the whole process again. You can export the data, put it into a bucket. You can promote the model to staging. And then the next time that the training pipeline runs, it's gonna run on the new data. So I apologize that I couldn't show you this, this last thing, this closing of the loop, um, but I, I think you can you can imagine what would have happened. I think that's that's completely. I mean, it wouldn't be a live demo without these things happening. Um, <laughs> I I think it's completely fine. Maybe just to talk about it from a Xenomel perspective. Um, maybe if you can put our screen up, so you can see um, I, we have our ship detector. I, I think I I just want to close on this because it's really a, a lot of questions were around the semantics of the model. So you have pipelines and models. If you click on the ship detector model, I can see um, all the models that the guys have trained um, basically since this we started preparing for this webinar. And one of them is in production, um, and some of them are in staging. Um, and you can, if I click on one, I can see probably all the predictions that were made, um, all the validation metrics, all the training data that was used to actually train these two, this particular model artifact. I can see all the metrics of this. And I can keep creating these versions over time and like sort of promote things as they go. And, and you, it's one thing doing it for one customer or for one use case, but you can scale this up to all the different use cases in your, in your company. And you reuse the same pipeline sort of with different configurations, but always have a one source of truth for all of your training pipelines, inference pipelines, deployment pipelines exporting pipelines um, all in one central interface, which was the point we tried to make with ZenML, that it should be the source of truth for all these different things. Awesome. All right, then Alexa, do you have any final points? Otherwise we'll go to the next section. No, I, th I think from my side, the, the, the one thing, thing that I would mention there as well is if, if, if you want to run this for multiple projects, like the same kind of model for multiple customers, it's as easy as just creating a second configuration file. Like there's, there's no, no messing around with, with, with code, having to recreate code and adjust it for each customer. Like your code stays the same, your process stays the same. You just use different configurations. I, I, I got a message on the background that our colleague Alex got it running, by the way. Like, do you want to call him on stage to finish the demo? Sure. Let's do that. Right. <laughs> Impromptu by, by Alex. Alex, welcome Alex from our team as well. <laughs> Alex Trek. Hi. Uh, yeah, I thought I would just close it off, I guess, show you where Alexei was. So we were, had you know our images. And let's assume we've done the, the augmentations here. What you then could do is just like request your annotations, which is basically sending it over to Label Studio. Um, you'll need some kind of annotation key, so uh, uh, whatever. It just needs to be some kind of unique 
a unique string. Um, there are specific fields, um, like the boxes we can leave, but you know, we're, since we're going to be labeling this, we can call this ground truth. Um, and this is detections that we're talking about. We're interested in ships, so we can specify uh, a chip class that will be the thing that we want to annotate. And then we can just let it launch the editor um, oh, on a specific project. Uh, so this will be this will be on the label studio uh, end. Um, and we click execute. It will open up label studio, which is running. And I'd selected three images that I wanted to uh, to annotate. So you can just click label tasks, and you know, um, then you're then you're away. You're going through uh, through your images. No, uh, no boats here. But you know, we've got we've got a ship here, and we've got a ship here, and we submit, and no more tasks left in the queue. Whatever. And you know, now we're back at the beginning of the flywheel, um, where. You know, we can retrain and we can bring all of the new annotations back in uh, as part of the whole process. Great magic! You, you came in at the last minute and <laughs> finished our loop for us. Um, no worries. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Alex. Uh, all right, looking at the time, we have we've had great engagement in this webinar, um, and we're almost at the end of it. I, I, I'd I'd like to use the last few um, seconds just for any Q and A. So if you have any more questions now, go from the chat to, to the Slido. Again, you can scan the QR code. Um, it's, it was, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's always, it's already been great. So maybe there's a few questions I'll take. Um, Eric was talking about how our, it looks a bit rigid, the assigning of staging production, all those things. I really like that in, input because when we were designing the model control plane, we thought a lot about these tags, staging, production, development, whether they would be too loose uh, or too tight. Um, we ended up on the end that it's better to enforce these because you can then really not mess up uh, downstream pipelines if you have like these canonical words. And we delegated the flexibility part of it to tags, which is another concept in Cinnamon. That's where we, after many hours of discussion, we landed on this internally. <laughs> Um, but we might be wrong, and this is great feedback from Eric that he wants more flexible tagging systems. Alexa? I would quickly just go on the, the first question that I see here, uh, converting annotations back already, and forth. I already oh, you already answered, answered that, it. but you can, I, 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 I can just tell you it's, you, but it's, it's very painful. I already mentioned very that. Very frustrating. Um, <laughs> I think settle early on on one um, on one format that works for you, and then always convert things into that and then you at least have one central language within your repo i think 51 helps a lot if you if you use that to to manage your labels um i think that that helps a bit um the initial pain chat gpt helps if you give an example of one data like how one data format and another can help you mm -hmm. write conversion scripts but you don't want to be dealing with that a lot so try to get all everything into one format early on fantastic Cool. Um, it looks like most of the questions were asked uh, answered in chat. So I'll maybe even uh, we're really late on time. Maybe we can close it out. So from my side, thank you so much. It, we've learned a lot doing this webinar. We're looking forward to talking with all of you afterwards. Join our Slack community. But I think Yamur has uh, something cooking. Uh, Yamur, would you would you come back on stage? I know you have something to share with us. Yes, thank you so much, Hamza. Thank you, people, for being here today. Um, so I just want to quickly mention you. Um, so first of all, again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, and Hamza and Alexe, we really want to support you on your computer vision projects and all MLOs. We really are. We have a team who are really passionate about this. So um, as I already mentioned, this will probably be only the first webinar of a series that we are going to host in the future. And for this reason, we want to introduce you an exclusive, ex exclusive offer. And we want to actually extend our support for your um, use cases. So in this QR code, you will see a survey where you can talk about and define, describe your use cases. 
and we will with the team we will go through your use cases and we will select the most three interesting ones where the ones that we can support you and then we will reach out to you and then we will extend our support for your use case and we will communicate and lead you throughout your journey so i will leave the screen a little bit longer uh, here so that you can use your phones scan the qr code tell us about your use case so that um, we can reach out to you and we can support you and of course uh, i already sent in the chat our slack link but just join slack and whatever the questions that you have regarding ZenML and your use cases, you can always shoot a message in the general channel. We are super responsive. We are always there for you. And also, if you want to like describe something longer and prefer emails rather than quick Slack messages, and also you can always send us an email. And we are very, really happy to uh, be there for you. So again, thank you so much. And Adam, thank you. Adam also sent the link of the form survey in the chat. You can also find it there. Um, but after the webinar, we will also be sending you an email. You will also find the survey link there. It will also be easy for you, I assume. Again, thank you so much for uh, joining everyone. Alexei, Hamza, thank you again. Until everyone leaves, I will stay here just to make sure that everyone gets the <laughs> QR code. Um, but I think we are done for the day. Anything Thank else you. you want to add, people? Huge okay, thanks perfect. to Alex. <laughs> you thanks to Alex. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> the last minute. And, and thank you for the amazing audience. I, I didn't expect so engaged, so much engagement. Uh, we, all, we already perfect. know we have the best community and uh, you guys showed us again. Thank you. Thank you, people. Hamza took the QR code with him. And oh, no. <laughs> OK, I will share it. I think Adam is also posting the link to it in the chat. Yes, but just in case. Bye, Tomek. Um, and people are still here. All right, I'll also be dropping. Thanks, everyone. OK. See you, See you, Alex. Say. <laughs> okay. I I always do the same. I'm sorry. Okay, still 33 people. I will make sure that you see the screen. Okay. Perfect. So people, have a great day. I will leave the screen here and hope to see you soon somewhere.